People are always signing up to learn a new skill. You been there? You know, and there's classes for everything. Flying lessons, computer lessons, language skills, guitar lessons, gardening, quilting. If you want to learn it, it's out there. And there are bookstores that if you go to the right section, they have this place called self-help, and they'll tell you how to, to actualize your best you, and you can live your best self starting if you'll just do these few simple steps. Uh, if there's something you want to learn, whether it's square dancing or quilting, uh, sewing, if you want to learn it, somebody's out there that'll teach you. Amen? A few years ago, I took two of my nephews deer hunting. We were able to get enough deer to kind of fill the freezer for the year, and we were on the way to our deer lease. And my nephew, who grew up in the city, he's quite an athlete, he's quite a salesman, he said, Uncle Mike, I want you to know I've been watching them YouTube videos on how to skin deer. I said, really? He said, yes, sir. I said, okay. So we shoot a couple of deer, and we get them hung up. I said, get after it, son. You know what he learned? He learned that the smells and the sights are different when you're in person than they are when you're watching it on a YouTube video. You know, there are some things you have to learn by being there. You can learn anything you want to learn, but here's a question. Who teaches us how to live? Who teaches us how to really live life? We learn from our parents, and some of the lessons we learn from our parents are examples of what not to do. Have you been there? You've been there as a child? You've been there as a parent? Yes, I have too. And some of the lessons that our parents teach us are the correct way to live, but how do we really learn about life? In our text today, we're going to find John the Baptist teaching us some life lessons. And John the Baptist, he had one of the most important jobs in the entire New Testament. His job was to introduce Jesus, the Messiah, to the Jewish people. His task was to prepare them to receive their Messiah. His task was to call them to repent of their sin and prove out their repentance through baptism and change lives. Let me tell you something, as a man who's been in the ministry for a while, I, I went back and counted uh, this year later on will be 39 years I've been in the ministry, and I too have learned what John the Baptist learned. People don't like it when you point out the sin in their life. They don't like it at all. And so we're continuing our series, Learning from God's People. You say, wait a minute, preacher, we were in the Old Testament, that's right. Starting today, we're going to be jumping back and forth. We're going to go in the New Testament four or five weeks. We're going to go back to the Old Testament four or five weeks. I don't want you to get bogged down, okay? So we're going to be going back and forth today. We're starting with John the Baptist in the New Testament. And one thing I want you to know today is that whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you can trust the Word of God. It is dependable in teaching us how to live all of God's Word, Old Testament and New Testament, is inspired. All of God's Word is inerrant. All of it is just that. It's God's Word. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and if I will hide His Word in my heart, I will not sin against God. And we have so much to learn from God's people, some by how they made terrible mistakes, some how they disobeyed God that cost many people's lives, somehow they walk victorious when they follow God's plan, and just about everything in between. We need to be sure that we understand these were and are real people. Sometimes we read the Bible, we think we're reading about Popeye and the cartoon character. These are real people who walked with a real God, and we can learn real lessons from them. And when we focus on the truths they learn, we can learn what they meant so we can learn what they mean. You see, we don't study God's Word just to figure out what it meant. We study God's Word to figure out what it meant so we can bring it forward to say, what does this mean in my life? How can I apply this to my life today? And so as we think about that, let's continue today learning from God's people. John chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 15 through verse 29. John 1, verse 15. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. 
Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from His fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son. No one has ever seen God, period. The one and only Son, the one who is at the Father's side, has revealed Him. This is John's testimony when the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He did not refuse to answer, but he declared, I am not the Messiah. What then, they asked him, Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Who are you then? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What can you tell us about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they've been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him, why then do you baptize if you aren't the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered them. Someone stands among you, but you don't know him. He's the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. All this happened at Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptized. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Pray with me. Father, help us correctly handle your word of truth today. To learn what it meant so we can learn what it means, God. Our goal today, Lord, is not to gather a bunch of information about John the Baptist. Our goal is to have our lives transformed because we've been in your presence and we've been in your word. So, Father, help us understand it, bring it forward, and change it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it can be a little confusing because this gospel was written by John the Apostle. He's talking about John the Baptist, so don't get those two confused. And so you see in verse 15, John the Apostle says, John, talking about John the Baptist, testified about him. And so John the Baptist tells us three important things about Jesus. First of all, he says he is eternal. And here's the catch of this strange terminology in verse 15. John says, the one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Clear as mud, right? What in the world is John the Baptist talking about? The, the, the deal is, is that physically, John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. And so, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. We know that from when his mother Elizabeth was pregnant, and John the Baptist jumped in the womb when Mary came to visit her, and she was pregnant with Jesus, and Elizabeth said, something wonderful has happened because my baby just turned to flip. And so, John the Baptist is older than Jesus by about six months. But he says, he existed before me. How is that true? Because we know he's telling us that Jesus is pre-existent. There never has been a time, nor will there ever be a time, when Jesus was not. He has always been. And then he says, he is the fullness. Look at verse 16 and 17. The fullness of God's grace and truth. And it's not that grace was not available before God and the person of Jesus Christ came to earth. In the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, God was showing grace to Israel every time they took a pigeon or a dove or a lamb or a ram and they slaughtered it on the altar. God was showing grace because that blood was sprinkled on the altar signifying the atonement, the covering of their sin. God was showing grace to sinners through the blood then like He shows grace to the sinners through blood now. Only now we have one sacrifice and that blood covers all. That old system was just a shadow of the things coming. You can read all about that in Hebrews 8, 9, 10, and 11. Let me just give you one verse. Hebrews 8, 7 says, For if that first covenant had been found faultless, there would be no occasion for a second one. But when Jesus came, He introduced the new covenant. And when the new covenant came, there was a fullness of grace and truth only found in Him. So not only are we saved by grace, we know that Ephesians 2, 8, we are saved by grace. But now we live by God's grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10 says this, But by God's grace I am what I am. By God's grace I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not ineffective. However, 
I work more than any of them, Paul said, yet not I, but God's grace within me. So what John shows us here in verse 15 through 18 is that he is eternal. He's the fullness of grace and truth. And finally, in verse 18, we see that Jesus reveals God to us. No one has ever seen God. Now, you might recall Moses. Lord, let me see your face. Come on, Lord, i got to know who I'm talking to. If I'm going to go talk to your people for you, let me see your face. And what God did is He said, I will hide you in the rock, and my presence will pass by you, and I will pronounce my name Yahweh in your presence. But then God says this, My face shall not be seen because you cannot see my face and live. But now in Jesus, now in Jesus, look what it says. He has revealed Him. Jesus has revealed the Father. That, that word revealed, it's the word in Greek we get our English word exegete from. You know what it means to exegete? We talk about exegetical preaching when we press out the, the meaning of the text and we, and we give that to you. To, to, to exegete something means we are revealing the meaning of the Bible. And this is what Jesus does for us. He is exegeting the Father. He is revealing to us. And the simple truth is we cannot know and understand the Father apart from the Son. Not only is Jesus the Son of God, he's called that some 43 times in the New Testament. <coughs> Never forget, not only is Jesus the Son of God, he is also God the Son. He is God incarnate. And John the Baptist is one of the six people who are named in the Gospel of John that declared Jesus is God. He's joined by Nathaniel, by Peter, the blind man who was healed, Martha and Thomas. But, but these religious leaders, they could not believe. In fact, here in our text, they're interviewing John the Baptist. And our Bible say in verse 19 that these were Jews from Jerusalem sent. Most likely, the ruling party of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, sent them. And John pointed them not to himself, but right to the one who really matters, Jesus. So let's see what we can learn from John the Baptist about how to live life. We can learn this. Some people know a whole lot, amen? But nobody knows it all. There may have been no single person alive this day, except for maybe Joseph and Mary, who knew Jesus better than John the Baptist. Their cousins, they lived together, they lived close together, they played together. They probably went to school together. The, these guys know each other. And when John began his ministry, he had only one message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what we don't know for sure, but what we can assume from what I'm about to show us, is that at this time, John, probably like many others, thought Jesus was here to establish an earthly kingdom that would overthrow the Roman government and he would have his own kingdom established on earth in Israel. John preached, John taught what he understood would happen, but there came a time when everything changed for John, the cousin of Jesus. He understood at some point in time that Jesus is more than a military king leading a takeover of Rome. He learned that he is the sacrifice that God requires the payment of the sin of the whole world. He learned that the kingdom of heaven was not here and now, in the way he was thinking, rather it's here in our hearts. And not only now, but for eternity. And I think much like Jesus' own disciples, John came to understand who Jesus was progressively. He knew a little bit more about him next week than he knew about him this week. And by the way, isn't that the way we all ought to be about Jesus? We ought to have a progressive faith, one that's growing. And be careful that you don't think that you've arrived. And it seems to me that the longer that I know the Lord, the longer that I serve the Lord, the better I understand the Lord, the better I understand how far I've yet to grow. But John's place is carved out in history. If you were to jump over to Matthew 11, 11, I think I've got it on the screen for us. 
Jesus said this. He said, I assure you among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. Well, that's a pretty impressive list. Pretty much includes everybody, doesn't it? We're talking Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We're talking Moses, Isaiah. We're talking Elijah and Elisha. Don't forget the Apostle Paul. And Jesus says, of all those people that have lived, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. He has appeared. But then, look down the page in John to verse 31 and see what John said. John said in verse 31, I didn't know him. Hmm. What in the world? How could John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, grew up together, preaching for him, how in the world could he say, I didn't know him? He'd known him all of his life. How could it be that, that God gave John the Baptist such greatness that Jesus would say, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but he left him in the dark about exactly who Jesus is and exactly what his mission is. Even after John had announced two verses before in verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And don't forget that when John was in Herod's prison, in Matthew 11, it says this, When John heard what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message to his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect somebody else? Here's the best way I know how to explain this. God gives each one of us a measure of faith, a measure of understanding, a measure of wisdom, a measure of knowledge, but these leave us lacking. The other thing is, when, do you, when can you say that you really know another person? When, when can you say that? I mean, I know Cynthia. I know her pretty well. But I don't know her anything like Bill knows Cynthia. They've been together 78 years now, right? <laughs> Is it close? It feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> but they know each other. And so could it be that maybe John's saying, yeah, I, I knew him. He's my cousin. We grew up, you know doing things cousins do together, but I didn't really know all there was to know about him. I think what, what God does is He reveals enough of Himself to us to make us hungry so we'll want some more and we'll want some more and we'll want some more. And so in the truest sense of the word, aren't you glad you really don't know all about Jesus there is to know of Him? Because it makes us keep coming back and wanting more and more. And against the backdrop of John's lack of full understanding, you go back to what we read earlier, Jesus is the fullness. Verse 17. And part of this greatness of John the Baptist is that he finally understood that in Jesus alone does all the fullness of God dwell. And, and then we see how Jesus' character confounded people. If you look at, at the words of John the Baptist carefully, look at verse 27. He says, He's the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to untie. Look at verse 30. This is the one who I told you about. After me a man comes who has surpassed me because he existed before me. Go over to John chapter 3, verse 30, and John says this. Let me set the stage for you here before I read this. If you go back to verse 22, John the Baptist is in the middle of a revival. And people are getting saved, and people are getting baptized, and John's fame is spreading throughout the countryside. And when Jesus shows up, what, is, what does John say? He must increase, but I must decrease. In fact, there was a time when John said to the disciples who were following him, leave me and go follow Jesus. 
try to find a preacher willing to tell some of his disciples to go to somebody else's church today. Hmm. And John the Baptist is in prison. He's finally beheaded because of what he knew about Jesus. And, and people will, will not die for things they don't really believe in. But knowing the character of Jesus put John the Baptist in a place where he's willing to die for him. And, and there could be a lot more people on this list, but I thought about people like Flavius Josephus, Alfred Edersheim. You may not have heard of those two guys. More recently, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel. All of these men set out to disprove that Jesus Christ is God himself. And all of those men became apologists proving that Jesus Christ really is God himself. And maybe you could add to that list the Apostle Paul. He's going around with letters from the authorities rounding up Christians to have them put in jail and stoned. You see, it's the character of Jesus that keeps confounding people, even those who investigate his life in order to discredit his life and ministry. And you take any jeweler. If they're an honest jeweler and you go in there and you say, listen, I really love this woman and I'm going to propose to her and I want the perfect diamond. If you have an honest jeweler, what's he going to say? There's no such thing as a perfect diamond. Every diamond has a what? Flaw. You know why? Anybody ever thought about that? Why do diamonds have flaws? When Jesus hung on the cross, what happened? Darkness covered the earth. And the earth shook and rocks broke. And diamonds are rocks, are they not? And every diamond has its flaw because Jesus hung on that cross. But you know what else is true? There are no humans who have lived or who are living today or who will live in the future who have no flaws. We all have sin, don't we? And only one, Jesus Christ himself, lived in perfect obedience to God because he was born of a virgin without an earthly father. He had no imputed sin. Now that's a new word, isn't it? What's the word imputed mean? He had no imputed sin. We have two kinds of sin. We have inherited sin. Sin that's passed down to us from our father and from their father and from their father. And I know this is a small thing. You probably can't see it very well. But on the left, you see inherited sin went from Adam to Cain to Enoch and on down the line. But imputed sin comes from Adam and it goes to Cain and to Enoch and to Seth and to Enosh. But it also comes to me, not through them, but directly from Adam to me. That's what I talk about when I say imputed sin. But here's the deal. Jesus had neither imputed sin nor did he have inherited sin because he was born of a virgin. His father is the Holy Spirit who had no sin in the first place to pass on to him. Amen? And if you want a proof text for that, go to Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, it was passed on to us. But because Jesus had neither inherited sin or imputed sin, he confounded many men. Herod was so afraid of him. Think about this. Herod was so afraid of him, he ordered all the boys, two years old and younger, in the region of Bethlehem, be murdered. The Pharisees and Sadducees continually tried to trip him up in matters of the law, but every time he applied the law in the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law like they had been doing. And even in his death, he confounded so many people that a Roman soldier, one who hung him on that cross, said, surely this man was the Son of God. And I've said for years now that character always counts and it can never be more true today than it was this time. In the end, character really does matter. We know that John the Baptist ended up in prison where he was ultimately in prison. But why was he in prison in the first place? Was it because of what he was preaching? Was it because of the way he dressed that they thought he was a madman and needed to be sequestered? Was it because of the force of what he preached? I think none of those are true. I think the one thing that caused John the Baptist is not only because of what he was saying, but because of who he was. 
Remember those self-help books I talked about in the beginning? You want to be your best you? Read my book and start putting these principles into practice. Channel the power that lies within you to overcome any obstacle. Become a more powerful, more insightful, more passionate, more productive you. But what these books fail to realize is the power of personality comes from personal character. And the only way to develop godly character is to spend time with God Himself. John the Baptist knew this truth. And his character was shining through. It was tested by the religious. J just imagine the testing he went through. Look back with me at verse 19 through 23 or 4, 5. These people in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, tells us that the expectations were running high. People were looking for the Messiah, it says in Luke 2, 38. They were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. In this context, when the, these expectations are high that the Messiah is going to come, this man shows up and begins to preach a new message of judgment and condemnation and redemption. And, and, and this had the people at the barber shops and the what falafels in Jerusalem talking. Could it be? Is he the long-awaited one? We better ask. So they... The Jews sent a delegation to ask him, Who are you? Verse 19. And even before they asked the question, he asked them, he told them, I am not the Christ. He staggered, they're staggered, but they're not stumped, so they pressed on. They say, Well, then are you Elijah? Wrong again, he says. But are you the prophet? Wrong again, he says. Finally, Frustrated, they asked what they originally came to find out. They said, who are you? And this was John's big chance at fame. All he has to do is hear say, I am the Christ. I'm the Messiah. That's all John had to say. And he could have written his ticket. But he knows what we all really know deep down inside. That self-centered living only brings temporary benefits. God-centered living brings eternal benefits. And so he points them to Jesus. The one that you're really looking for is over there. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal strap. Why does he do this? How can he turn away all that fame and all that fortune? Because he's a man of character. A few weeks ago we had to go to Lubbock just on a quick deal. So we went by the ATM. You wouldn't believe it, but I had $300 in the bank I could take out. So I always take cash when we go on a trip, and you can punch on there. These ATMs are fancy now. You can punch on there. What kind of money do you want? Do you want 20s? Do you want 10s? Do you want 100s? So I always just get 100s because it's easier to put them in your pocket. So we stop at a convenience store on the way back. We bought a few things. It was 10 or $12, and I paid with a $100 bill, and she gave me back $20, too much change. People don't count change anymore, and people don't know how to count anymore. So I pushed that $20 bill back across the counter. I said, here, you gave me too much money. And she looked at me like a calf at a new gate. <laughs> and I said this, I need my integrity is worth more than $20. Oswald Chambers says this in his book, you probably all have it on yourself. My utmost for his highest. He says the final stage in a life of character. The final stage in the life of faith is character. We have to learn to maintain character up to the last notch revealed in the vision of Jesus Christ. Abraham Lincoln was a man of profound inner strength. When he arrived in Washington, most people thought he was a bumbling backwoods lawyer. One of the senators, his cabinet member actually, Salmon Chase, once called him a fool. And a reporter asked President Lincoln about this cabinet member calling him a fool. 
And Abraham Lincoln responded, Well, Mr. Chase is an educated man. And if he said that, I believe the matter deserves looking into. <laughs> By the end of our country's civil war, many had come to believe Lincoln had no peer in American history. His character has certainly not been surpassed by the politicians of our day and time. And after Hurricane Hugo raked havoc over Jamaica in September of 1989, a CNN reporter interviewed a banana farmer about his loss. And the farmer responded, this is my best Jamaican accent, Mon, we've lost our whole crop. And the interviewer said, what I hear you saying is, you've lost everything. That banana farmer says, no, we have not lost Jesus. That's character. John the Baptist teaches us about the character of a man and a woman of God. We do well to follow his example. Would you stand and pray with me? Oh, Father, we thank you for John the Baptist, of whom Jesus said, among men who have been born, there's no one greater. Thank you for these lessons you've taught us today about character, how it counts always from his life. Help us now, Lord, to make good decisions based on what you've taught us. And the best decision we can make today is that if I'm here and I've never trusted this same Jesus that John the Baptist was talking about, today's the day that God could be calling me to repent of my sin and turn to Jesus and Him alone in faith and receive God's forgiveness for all my sin. But better than that, I can receive the glory of eternal life in heaven. Father, help us listen carefully to your Holy Spirit and respond in making our decisions. We pray it in Jesus' name.